All right, we're underway with uh, session two of the first regathering, page nine of your notebook. So let's do a little bit of a review. Uh, last week we had our introductory session, a lot of administration, and then we covered the material that's used in this course, and I suggested to you additional books and resources to consider uh, as you, uh, if you want to study more on your own and in greater depth. Then uh, we ended the session after the break by looking at the introductory program to the uh, DVD series Against All Odds Israel Survives. And program one kind of laid the uh, foundation for this series, which we'll see a few videos out of this series. And by the way, you can uh, watch these videos on, um, on uh, let's see, uh, Amazon Prime. If, uh, especially if you're a member, you can watch these videos for free. If not, I think it's a couple of bucks to watch a video. So they are available outside of um, the class here because, of course, I can't photograph them because I don't want to. I don't want to uh, break any copyright laws. So it, it is available outside of Adavar. So anyway, in uh, session number one, Michael Greenspan received this uh, uh, assignment to go to Israel and try to find out an answer to some of the very odd events that have happened in Israel and the um, the uh, assertion by many people that these events are miracles. Uh, Roger, could you hand that over to Linda Lee? Thank you. Do you have one? Oh, you have one, okay. <clears throat> so during his uh, introduction to the video, Michael Greenspan asked 10 questions. And by the way, the morning class asked for a copy of these questions, so you'll get them too. He asked, number one, how have the Jewish people managed to survive 2,000 years in exile? Two, how did we manage to build a nation out of almost nothing? Three, how did Israel manage to win the 1948 war? Was that just good luck? <clears throat> Number four, in 1973, in 1973 you'll find, you'll see that Israel was on the verge of destruction. In 1973, why did President Nixon, who is considered by many to be devoutly anti-Semitic, order the biggest arms airlift since World War II and save Israel? He wonders about that. Why did that happen? <laughs> Fifthly, why were no Israelis killed by Saddam Hussein's Scud missiles during the Gulf War? Very unusual. Six, why are the outcomes of Israel's wars so unique? Remember he said that war colleges won't study Israel's wars because they don't make sense? You know, Israel should never win them. Okay. Seven, how did Hebrew become the only dead language in history to become revived? It's a living language again. Eight, after 2,000 years, why would millions of people move from around the world, leave their homes and move to a desert wasteland and build new lives for themselves? Why in the world would they give up the comforts of where they were living for the struggles of being in a kibbutz or a moshav or building a building a brand new city, something like that. Nine, how did these people turn a land that was more than 80% desert into one of the largest food and flour exporters in the world? And finally, 10, why do incredible achievements in science, medicine, and new technologies happen here in greater concentration than anywhere else? Okay. Well, by the end of this course, you'll have an answer for every single one of those questions. Okay, you'll be able to answer them. Michael Greenspan couldn't, and uh, he's going to leave the answer up to you when he gets through this, uh, this uh, uh, DVD series. So again, we'll see some more of those as we go along. So this brings us, question. Uh, can I make one comment, please? Mr. Nixon uh, truly did what he did, but Mr. Kissinger was Secretary of State at the time, mm -hmm. and there was a wedge dialogue between the two gentlemen. Mr. Nixon asked the question, how many aircraft we have available to commit to such an operation. And they committed some 23 or 4 C-5 aircraft. Right. Which was the entire U.S. Air Force. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. He, during that airlift, the entire U.S. Air Force fleet was used. So was exactly. Was no, it was, it was a massive airlift, yeah. It was the full capability. Yeah, yeah, the uh, largest airlift since World War II. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Why would the president of this uh, aid a small little country in that way? Yeah, thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. All right, page nine. Page nine in your notebook. 
So we'll start with uh, the biblical material that underlines the uh, purpose of our, our class. You know, uh, the first regathering, uh, modern Israel, is uh, the first is the reestablishment of the state of Israel. Is the modern state of Israel of God or of man? You know, why did it occur? Is it miraculous or is it just a lot of dumb luck? So uh, we'll look at this material, and this is essential material. That's the reason I'm starting with this. This is really essential material that you should master. <coughs> And a number of you have seen some of this material before, so uh, you're probably wondering, oh no, I've got to go through that again. But it's very important to help, uh, you know, brand this stuff into your head. Because if you understand this material, you'll understand the Bible. You know, you won't understand the Jewish people, and you won't understand the modern state of Israel if you don't understand the biblical foundation. <laughs> I mean, period. Uh, so this is, this is critical critical stuff. So we're going to work through it and uh, I'm going to try and, and do it in the clearest uh, manner that I can. Now this material can also be found in my book, The Biblical Perspectives on the Middle East. I put this material in book form because I think it's so essential it needs to get out in whatever media, um, whatever form of the media that exists. So we, we did it in a book form just so we get, get out in that way. So we have copies of this book if you're interested in picking it up. B Biblical Perspectives on the Middle East. So we start with the question, what is Zion? So Zion, we pronounce it Zion. In Hebrew it's Zion. Zion. And the meaning of this word is really unknown. No, uh, we really don't know what it stands for. But in analyzing it, probably the best meaning would be fortress, stronghold. Something like that. Now originally Zion was the fortified mound between the Kidron and Tyropian valleys. It was the name of the Jebusite stronghold and the southeastern hill of Jerusalem on which it stood. So here is the map that's in uh, page, on page 9. And we have the southeastern hill uh, right here. This is the um, Mount Zion. And we have the Kidron Valley running down the eastern side of Mount Zion. And the Tyropian Valley, or the Central Valley, or the Cheesemongers Valley. You see all kinds of titles for this valley running down the western side. And in between the two, of course, the southeastern hill, Mount Zion. Now here's another view of the city. And again, here's the Tyropian Valley running up through the middle of the city. And the Kidron Valley, running on the eastern side of the city. And again, right between the two of them, there is Mount Zion, the city of David. Now there's a third valley that you should be, uh, should be familiar with. It's an important valley. Oh, do I do this? So it's valley important that you learn about it. Why are you pointing at me? And this is the Valley of Hinnom, uh, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, Gay Hinnom. And uh, we, we, uh, that name became anglicized into Gehenna, Gay Hinnom, into Gehenna. And it runs around the southern and western side of the city. <coughs> so those, those are the three valleys on which the city of Jerusalem is, is perched. And a good number of people have noticed that those three valleys that mark the city of Jerusalem look very much like the Hebrew letter Sheen. Okay, so you can see the three valleys there in the city. And uh, what does the Hebrew letter Sheen looks like? That's what the Hebrew letter Sheen looks like. One stroke would speak of the Kidron Valley, one the middle stroke of the Tyropian Valley, and the uh, left-hand stroke of the Valley of Hinnom. Three strokes united in one letter, right? Three in one. Now, if you remove one of those stro strokes from a sheen, does a sheen remain a sheen? No. You remove, remove any one of those strokes, and it's no longer a letter. It's no longer a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Three in one. Interesting, huh? Now, like you could call it looking like a crown, too. Yeah. Now, the Jewish community sees great significance in the sheen because the Sheen is the first letter of Shaddai. So when you, uh, Almighty, so El Shaddai, one of God's names, 
and you can see the sheen there, right? And so the sheen has become a symbol of God in the Jewish community. Three in one. Three strokes united in one letter. A good, good picture of the triune God, right? Three persons in one Godhead. Very, very nice little symbol. You see it all over the place. Uh, one place you see it is on the mezuzah. This is a olive wood mezuzah. And you can see the word Shaddai stamped on it. Um, that little piece of paper is a piece of parchment that is rolled up and put inside the mezuzah. But there is your sheen. Most of the mezuzot have a, a sheen on them, if not the whole word Shaddai, to remind us of God, at least the sheen. Now what in the world is a mezuzah? Some of you are asking. What kind of word is that? I can't even pronounce it. Well, the uh, mezuzah just means doorpost. And this is a, a religious item that is um, attached to the doorpost of the Jewish homes. It, um, it comes from the command in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 or 9. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. <coughs> Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So the Jewish community has taken this command very, very literally, and we attach uh, mezuzot, or mezuzahs, to the door frames of our houses in, uh, in obedience to this command. So you can see this Orthodox man here. He's just moved into this home in Jerusalem, and so he's a fasting a mezuzah to the doorpost. In an Orthodox home, you will see a mezuzah on every doorpost except a, a bathroom doorpost. And the mezuzah exists to be a reminder. When we go in and when we go out, we're to see these things and to be reminded that we are to be, be obeying God. We're to keep, uh, keep Him always into the forefront of our mind. Uh, reminding ourselves that He is looking over us, protecting us, evaluating us but also reminding us to obey his law. So that's the significance of the mezuzah in the Jewish community. So uh, whenever a Jewish person goes in and out of their rooms, they always see the sheen. They always see the sheen reminding them of El Shaddai, God Almighty. So whenever you look at the city of Jerusalem or see a map of the city of Jerusalem, take note of the three valleys, okay? Because they're a good reminder of the sheen and the sheen reminding us of El Shaddai. And the uh, city of Jerusalem marked by the sheen reminds us of the city that God chose to, in which to place his glory. You know, he placed the temple there and his glory appeared there. So this is the one city on earth where he chose to reveal his glory, uh, Jerusalem. So that's a little aside for you. Now back to the city of David. Here is another drawing of uh, the city of David. It was in the latest uh, Biblical Archaeology Review, so I scanned it in. So here we have the Kidron Valley on the eastern side, and then on the western side we have the Central Valley, and right in between the two of them there's the city of David, Mount Zion. Mount Zion. I like this drawing because it's got the city of David drawn in there. And uh, you can see that very clearly. Now this is Zion. This is Mount Zion. This is not Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is to the north. Mount Moriah is a hill that's a little higher than um, Mount Zion. And this is where the temple will eventually sit. So this temple sits on Mount Moriah and uh, the city of David is on Mount Zion. Okay, does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay, that's the difference between those two mountains. Is it, was that showing both? Or just yes, that's showing both both mountains. So uh, that's showing where the temple is. Yes, the temple will be up there. You see that flat spot up there? That would He's probably portraying the um, threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite there that David purchased. All right, now here's the way it looks today. If you go to Jerusalem today, this is what you'll see. Here is the Kidron. It is just about filled in uh, because Jerusalem's been a place of much destruction and a lot of wars. There's an awful lot of rubble in the Kidron Valley today. And so it is a lot shallower and a lot less steep than it was in uh, centuries gone past. But it is still visible today. The Tyropian Valley is totally filled in. 
You can't even see it today. Filled in with rubble from all the destructions that Jerusalem has gone through and modern, uh, modern um, building. So the Tyropian Valley is basically invisible today. So here is the city of David. This is uh, Mount Zion as it looks today. So not quite as imposing as it, uh, as it would have looked back in David's day. All right, so let's get back to what is Zion? The, first of all, originally the southeastern hill uh, of, uh, of the city. The Jebusite stronghold stood there and the city of David eventually would stand there as well. Then, over the course of time, the term Zion was expanded to include the Temple Mount. As time passed, the term Zion was expanded to include all of Jerusalem. And the expansion continued. Uh, then it was uh, eventually, it was eventually um, assigned to all of Judah and metaphorically to the Jewish people. So there's a number of uh, uses of the word Zion from the literal usage uh, Mount Zion to the figurative usage, the nation of Judah and the Jewish people. So throughout this process of change, this term also developed a religious connotation, emphasizing Jerusalem as the city of God and the Israelites as God's people. So there's a broad range of meaning to this term Zion. Now there are at least 163 verses in the scriptures that refer to Zion. So we'll look at a few of them. A number of them are <clears throat> listed in that uh, first paragraph on page 9. So let's look at a few. First in Tanakh, 2 Samuel 5, 7. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. So this is when David captured that Jebusite stronghold. And eventually it became his city, city of David. But it was called Zion there. Isaiah 60, verse 14, Isaiah speaks of it. God is speaking to, um, to uh, Jerusalem, metaphorically, Jerusalem is being personified here. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion, the stronghold, the fortress of the Holy One of Israel, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Moving into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, the writer of Hebrews also mentions Zion. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. So here Mount Zion and Jerusalem are synonymous terms. Now one last comment regarding Mount Zion. Uh, Biblical Mount Zion should not be confused with modern Mount Zion. They are two different animals. Here is a view of the city of Jerusalem, a map, top view so to speak. Here we have the Tyropian Valley or the Central Valley running along the west side of Mount Zion. But to the west of the Tyropian Valley is the western hill or the upper city. That has been labeled modern Mount Zion. When you go to Israel today, if you go to Mount Zion, you're actually going to the western hill. Okay, see the difference there? It's called Mount Zion, but it is not the biblical Mount Zion. And again, here's an, that, uh, another view, that three-quarter view of the city. Here we have the Tyropian Valley running through the uh, middle of the city. And to the west of the Tyropian Valley, there's modern Mount Zion. It's the upper city, biblically it's called the upper city or the western hill. But today it's called Mount Zion. That's a, really an inappropriate name for that particular hill. Okay, does that make sense? Alrighty. Alright, let's uh, take a look at the middle of uh, page 9 if you're following along there. Now, uh, all the scripture verses that I, that I read will be put up on the, um, on the screen. And there are no very few scripture verses in your in your text itself. You'll see read Genesis, you know, read Genesis 12.1. Well, Genesis 12.1 isn't in the text. It'll be up on the screen here. You can bring your Bible if you'd like. That's fine, but uh, every verse that I discuss will be up on the, on the overhead. All right, so point B. We found out what Zion is. Now, what is Zionism? A lot of opinions and definitions 
about Zionism and most of them pretty negative. For example, let's go to the website of Jews Not Zionists. These are ultra-Orthodox Jews and if you look in the lower left corner, their whole point is that Judaism is opposed to Zionism. Not all Jews are positive toward the state of Israel. And now here's four statements by some of their rabbis. I'll bring those statements out and we can look at them. Rabbi S.R. Hirsch. The Torah forbids us to strive for the reunion or possession of the land by any but spiritual means. What he probably means there is that the Messiah will bring us back to the land. We'll possess the land when the Messiah comes. And of course the Messiah hasn't come so we shouldn't be possessing the land because we haven't done it by spiritual means. Rabbi S.D. Schneerson. This is not Rabbi Menachem Schneerson who is the, uh, the head of Chabad for many, many years. I don't know exactly if it's a relation of his or not, but it's not the, it's not the Menachem Schneerson that was so well known a while back. Rabbi S.D. Schneerson says, not via our desire did we leave the land of Israel and not via our power will we come back to the land of Israel. The Messiah will bring us back. We should not do it ourselves. Uh, Rabbi C. Soloveitchik, Zionists want a state in order to make Jews into heretics. Hmm, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? And finally, Rabbi V. Soloveitchik, the Zionists have attacked the center point of Judaism. So uh, these rabbis are not very happy with Zionism. It's unspiritual, it's arrogant, it's a heresy. We want nothing to do with it. All right, page 10. Well, let's ask somebody else, okay? Let's ask somebody else. And by the way, uh, we'll go to the United Nations here, number two. We'll go to the United Nations and see what they say. And um, we're going to look at General Assembly Resolution 3379. And I got the text of the resolution from the Jewish Virtual Library. It's there in your, in your notebook, but you can look it up uh, for yourself if you want it. So let's look at United Nations General Assembly Resolution 3379, passed November 10th, <coughs> 1975. It lasted about 15 years, repealed in 1991. For 14, 15 years there was in existence. This was the United Nations opinion. Now I'm just going to give you the first few words of each paragraph. We're not going to read this whole thing. Paragraph number one. The General Assembly, recalling its resolution 1904, Paragraph 2, recalling also that it's, it's resolution 3151G. Third paragraph, taking note of the Declaration of Mexico. Fourth paragraph, taking note also of Re resolution 77, pa page 11. Taking note also of the political declaration, they come to a determination, determines that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. So that's their view of Zionism. Well, let's go to the Christian community. What does the Christian community say? Well, you know, there are anti-Semites in the Christian community. And uh, number three here uh, was a book written by Christian anti-Semite Stan Rittenhouse. It's a great book to read, you guys. Just really sweet. He wrote a book called For Fear of the Jews, page 7. And on page 7 you will read... During this period, in between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ, a satanic counterfeit, political Zionism, masquerading as the state of Israel, will be established. So that's his view of Zionism and the modern state. Hmm? What are his credentials? Who is this guy? Yeah, I, I have his book, but I don't know where he came from. <laughs> but there are anti-Semites in the, in the Christian community. All right, Where, what are we going to find out what Zionism is? Let's go to the Palestinians. Aha, what do they say Zionism is? Palestinian Charter, Section 22. Zionism is a political movement organically associated with international imperialism and antagonistic to all action for liberation and to progressive movements in the world. What a hypocrisy in that statement. It is racist and fanatic in its nature, aggressive, expansionist, and colonial in its aims, and fascist in its methods. 
<laughs> yeah, good comment. He must have been looking in a mirror, right? All right, well, maybe we better go to the Bible, huh? Okay, maybe we better go to the Bible. I'm going to give you a biblical definition of Zionism. The word Zionism describes a feeling. Zionism is an expression of the longing and yearning that the Jewish people have had in the past and still have for their homeland. As soon as any Jew expressed a desire to go back to his land, he is expressing Zionism. That's Dr. Fruchtenbaum's uh, definition, and we will see that this definition is totally accurate biblically in just a few minutes. All right, turn, page, turn to page 12. Page 12, you see an article uh, done by uh, Dr. Michael Rydelnik. He's the uh, Jewish Studies Professor at Moody Bible Institute. So that is a, an article well worth reading. So uh, read Michael, uh, Michael's um, article to put yourself to sleep tonight, okay? <laughs> no, it's a good article, well worth reading. So now we're on page 13. So I've said that Zionism is the longing of the Jewish people for their home. Well, let's look at some of the biblical support for that. Let's start with Psalm 137, 1 through 6. That is a section of scripture that I have put in your notebook. All right, here it is up on the screen as well. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. You see, the Jewish community has been deported to Babylon by the conquerors, the Babylonian conquerors, and they are now um, in exile in Babylon. There we sat down and wept. Deep emotional uh, depression there. We wept when we remembered what? When we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it we hung our harps. For there our captors tormented us. Excuse me. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our, torment, and our tormentors mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So the uh, Jewish people were being uh, mocked and abused by the Babylonians, you know. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem. Now here, Jerusalem and Zion are being, uh, are synonymous terms here. You see how they're linked together? How can I forget you, O Jerusalem? May my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So do you hear the emotional longing in that, in that um, psalm? That's, the, uh, that's Zion and Zionism. The emotional longing of the Jewish people for our homeland. But Zionism is not simply a subjective emotion. You know, you could write it off as, oh yeah, yeah, that's just your deal. You know, emotions change. There's nothing significant about emotions. But Zionism is not simply a subjective emotion. Zionism is, Zionism is likewise supported by two of the covenants God made with the Jewish people. So we're going to take a look at some of those covenants. Here's a suggested re resource for further study. Again, the My Messianic Bible Study Collection by Dr. Fruchtenbaum. Messianic Bible Study 21021, the eight covenants of the Bible. That'll give you more information on the covenants. And again, there's more information in biblical perspectives in the Middle East. So keep those in mind if you want a little deeper look into the covenants. Would you show that again for a minute? Okay, which one? The other one. Another one. Okay. Messianic Bible Study 21, the eight covenants of the Bible. You can get it on uh, www.ariel.org. You can um, download it. You can have it tonight. Get on the web tonight when you get home, and you can have it in your hands before you go to sleep. Ariel, www.ariel.org. Just, just uh, navigate to their uh, to their uh, uh, store on their web page. This might even be free. They have some free manuscripts up there, but if it's not free, it only costs you a few bucks. And again, it's downloadable. Okay, everybody got that? All right. All right, and then the other one, Biblical Perspectives, we have copies up here. All righty. Now I'm going to give you an overview of the Abrahamic Covenant. That's the first covenant we're going to look at. And by the way, this chart is on page 14. So here is a quick overview of the Abrahamic Covenant. Then we'll take our break and we'll look into this covenant in more detail. So the Abrahamic Covenant, 
essentially. It was made with Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, 15, and 17. It was instituted with Abraham. Then it was passed on and confirmed through Isaac, not Abraham's uh, other son Ishmael, but Isaac in Genesis 26. Then it was confirmed through Jacob, not through Esau, Isaac's other son Esau, but through Jacob in Genesis 28. Finally, it was confirmed to all 12 tribes in Genesis 49. And by the way, this is where you der derive the definition of who is a Jew. This is the biblical definition of who is a Jew. A Jew is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a family relationship. And for the male members of the family, circumcision is required as well. And do I have this printed anywhere? Um, that the definition? You have the chart. You have the chart on page 14. Okay. But the definition isn't there, no. Okay, do you want this slide? Yes. Everybody wants this slide? Okay. All right, we'll get you this slide. Let me write this down. Definition, who is a Jew? All right, we'll get that for you next week, okay? Now, Amos 3.2 points out the fact that we are one of the families of the earth. In Amos 3.2, God says, You only, speaking of the Jewish people, you only have I chosen. There's the basis for being called the chosen people. You only have I chosen among what? All the families of the earth. And you know, there's a lot of people that want to be Jewish. It's fun to be Jewish. Well, you better be careful. It's not always fun to be Jewish. God goes on. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Okay, to be chosen is a double privilege, right? But with special privilege comes what? Special responsibility. And with special responsibility comes what? Special punishment, okay? So it's not always fun to be Jewish. But uh, it, the definition of who is a Jew is we're a member of a very large extended family. Now, just to complete our overview of the Abrahamic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant consists of three promises. The land promise, the nation promise, or the seed promise, and the spiritual blessing promise. So we'll get into this covenant in a little more detail right after the break starting in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12. So go ahead and take your break and listen for the shofar, and then we'll pick it up in about 10-15 uh, minutes. All right, we're underway again, and we're in the middle of uh, page, well, let me back up here. We're in the middle of page 13, and we're going to take a look at the first covenant that supports Zionism, the Abrahamic covenant. We just finished our overview of the Abrahamic Covenant. Linda Lee, here's your uh, clipboard. Yeah, there we go. And now we're going to take a look at the Abrahamic Covenant in detail. Now the Abrahamic Covenant is found in several sections of Genesis. And the first section is Genesis chapter 12 and the first three verses. So um, up on the screen here is Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. You won't find this. Where it says read Genesis 12, 1, you won't find the verses there. You'll find the verses on the screen or in your Bible. Now the Lord said to Avram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Now, th three promises make up this unconditional and eternal covenant. Number one, God is going to show Abraham a land. And this promise is twofold. So here's the land promise. Not only will Abraham be given the land, but it will be given to his descendants as well. And the fact that the descendants inherit the land is brought out in verse 7. So we drop down here to Genesis 12, 7. The Lord appeared to Avram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So the second segment of the Abrahamic Covenant comes after Abraham enters the land that God had promised him. And God proceeds to tell Abraham that his descendants, his seed, will be given this land. 
But nothing more is said as far as the land is concerned until we get to verse 7 where there's an increase in, in information. God goes from merely showing him the land in verse 1 to giving it to his descendants in verse 7. All right, let's take a look now at uh, Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17. It repeats this promise. Genesis 13, 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and its breadth, for I have given it to you. All righty. So two main points come out of this passage. First of all, there's a further elaboration of the land aspect. Concerning the, lot, the land, God says again, to you I will give the land. Not only his descendants, but Abraham himself is promised the land. And therefore he's ordered to inspect the land. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land. I'm giving it to you. All right, let's move back to Genesis uh, chapter 12. We looked at verse 1. Let's take a look at the first part of verse 2. Genesis 12, 2, A. I will make you a great nation. So the second point we need to note here is the national aspect or the seed aspect, the seed promise. Again, a nation will come forth from Abraham that will eventually become numerous. And this is a twofold promise as well. A second provision covers the relationship the Gentiles will experience with the people who come from Abraham. Those who bless Abraham will be blessed and those who curse Abraham and his seed will be cursed. And this is Genesis 12, 3. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. So again, here is the national promise. First of all, your people are the chosen people, national election. And your people will experience a unique relationship with the Gentile nations. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. That isn't said of any other nation in the world. It's not said of the USA. It's not said of Russia, England, China, Japan, Iran, anybody. It's only said of the Jewish people and the land of Israel. Uh, Question. So would uh, the U.S., for example, have uh, gotten some of its uh, uh, blessings Yes, possibly. I can't elaborate what exactly they would be, but yes, since the United States has been the uh, greatest um, refuge for the Jewish people in the current time, um, part of the blessings we enjoy comes from that relationship. Sure, of course, yeah. yeah. All righty. Now, the third provision concerns the spiritual benefits of the covenant. Ultimately, it's in Abraham that the Gentiles will receive their spiritual blessings. And again, the promise is twofold. Here's our Abrahamic covenant. Uh, and this is, uh, God will bless Abraham, I will bless you, and Abraham will then bless the world. And this is also found in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right, so there is the basic Abrahamic covenant. Now, another factor relating to the Abrahamic covenant is the fact that it's an eternal covenant. It's an eternal covenant. Now, uh, we're going to work through uh, another chart, and if you want to look at it, this chart is on page 17, the top of page 17. So you have this material in, uh, in your workbook. All right, we know... Here's the basic Abrahamic covenant, and now we learn in other sections of Scripture that it is an eternal covenant. And a number of uh, verses of Scripture substantiate that. I will only look at one. I've got four of them uh, listed in the chart. There are many more. But let's just take a look at one. Let's look at Genesis 17, verse 7. 
I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So it's an eternal covenant. But we also learn from other sections of scripture that it is an unconditional covenant, an unconditional covenant. And this is seen in Genesis 15. So let's work our way through Genesis 15. We'll start in verses 1 through 6. And uh, we're now, uh, as far as my commentary goes, we're at the top of page 15. So what does uh, Genesis 15, 1 through 6 say? After these things, the word of the Lord came to Avram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Avram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Avram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Avram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. That was the common cultural uh, uh, expression of, uh, in, the, in that day. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man, speaking of Eliezer, this man will not be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So this fourth segment of the Abrahamic covenant is chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. And the entire chapter basically is devoted to this theme of the Abrahamic Covenant. Now in verses 1 through 6, we just saw an elaboration of the seed aspect. Again, Abraham is assured, and it's been a good number of years since the initial promise of a seed. Nevertheless, he's going to have a son. This son will come through Sarah, and uh, through Sarah and the son, the entire nation and people will emerge. As we move on to verses 7 through 21, God begins to deal with the land aspect. Now in this segment, God is going to state the actual southern and northern and southern boundaries of the land. And we'll also see in chapter 15 the sealing of the covenant. Now let me give you some background regarding how covenants were sealed in those days. The normal pattern by which covenants were sealed or signed back in uh, those days followed this procedure. The two parties making the covenant would take a number of animals and they would slaughter them and they would cut them in half. Then they would lay the two carcasses in two rows and the two people who were making the covenant would walk between, they would walk through the pieces of the animals. What they were saying as they walked through the pieces of the animals was something like this. May what happened to these animals happen to me if I break this covenant. This was a self-curse, you know, this is a, they were saying, I will do, I should be cursed if I don't keep up my end of the bargain. Now we see this uh, clearly brought out in uh, the book of Jeremiah, Jer Jeremiah 34, 18. I've used the NIV here because I think they've done a clearer rendition of the thought. Here's what we see in Jeremiah 38, 34, 18. God is speaking. He says, The men who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and walked between its pieces. Okay, so God is going to judge these men for breaking the covenant they made with them. And it's pictured by that... that um, the uh, animals being slaughtered and cut in two. Now having walked through the pieces, the covenant or the treaty was binding on both parties. Both were obligated to keep it. If one is guilty of breaking the covenant, that would release the other party from fulfilling his part of the covenant. Now there are certain things that are the same and certain things that are different as we come to this covenant with the Abraham uh, when this covenant with Abraham is sealed. So let's pick it up now in verse 7. We'll go from 7 to 11. Genesis 15, 7 to 11. He said to him, 
I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Avram drove them away. So here's an illustration of what Avram has done. Now I don't think this is the greatest illustration. I wish somebody would do a better job, but it does give you the idea here of the animals that have been slaughtered, cut in two, and the pathway between them. Now um, you see Abraham uh, chasing these birds of prey away, and uh, uh, one of the students in the morning class asked, what do you think is the meaning of the birds? I really didn't have a good explanation for him, so I looked it up uh, before this class. And there's a lot of opinion about the meaning of the birds. So I'm going to kind of give a very conservative explanation. I think basically this is an audiovisual lesson about what he's uh, teaching Abraham about the future of his descendants. Uh, he's going to tell Abraham that his descendants are going to be uh, in, enslaved in a country not their own. And uh, God will bring him out of that country. And so I think the birds there speak of the Egyptians who are going to be enslaving and abusing the Jewish people. And we've already seen Abraham make his great statement of faith. Uh, Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. So by faith, these people will be brought out of, uh, out of Egypt by faith in God and faith in the covenant. So I think that's what the whole picture is. I think this is an audiovisual <clears throat> preparing Abraham for what is going to come next. So Abraham has set up the covenant ritual. Yes? What is the significance between all the different kinds of animals given? Well, they're basically uh, sacrificial animals, although no sacrificial system has been instituted at this point. But that's, uh, that's about the only thing we can say about them. He didn't need to, do, to, to take uh, three, um, three animals and a couple of birds. He didn't have to. One would have done. Okay. So uh, again, about all we can say is they are sacrificial uh, uh, animals. Yes? I'm just a little confused. Later on, Abraham <coughs> buries Sarah, and he buys the field from the guy mm -hmm. to bury her. And I'm just wondering why he didn't just say, hey, God told me I own this land, so you know, move aside, I'm going to bury my wife here. Uh, you'll have to ask Abraham that. I've wondered that myself. <laughs> but the Canaanites were in the land. They, they dominated the land. He had no physical power and uh, he didn't exercise any uh, any rights given to him under the covenant so it's up to him why we'd have to ask why but he did purchase the land it was unquestionably his by covenant and by purchase yeah alrighty so uh, Abraham has set up the covenant ritual now let's go on to verses 12 through 16 and you'll see this picture portrayed before you that I just talked about now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Avram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Avram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So there's the picture of uh, Abraham's family being brought into slavery in Egypt. And uh, they'll be enslaved, God says, for 400 years in a different land. However, after that time of slavery, God will release them from slavery. He will enrich them and punish the nation that enslaved them. And then they will return to the land of promise when God's judgment is about to fall upon the Amorites. Now that term Amorite is a generic term for Canaanite. It's a generic term for all the Canaanite tribes. All right, let's move on to verses 17 through 21. It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark 
and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Avram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, and the Kenizzite, and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. So in keeping with the way that covenants were signed back then, the pieces of the animals were lined up, and the ritual is all ready, everything is normal at this point, but now the change has come. If God and Abraham both walk through the pieces of the animals, the covenant would have been binding on both. If Abraham broke it, that would release God from the terms of the promises. Therefore, it is God himself, God alone. Remember, Abraham had a deep sleep fall over him in verse 12. Abraham did not join God in this ritual. God himself, God alone, in the form of the Shekinah, in the, the form of the Shekinah, in the form of the glory of God, walks between the pieces of the animals. And here's an illustration of God making the covenant with Abraham. And he uses two forms of the Shekinah glory that are very, very appropriate to the exodus from Egypt. First of all, the, the torch. That would signify the pillar of fire that guided the nation at night. And then the smoking fire pot. That would be significant because it would, it would um, portray the pillar of cloud that guided the people during the day. So using these two forms of uh, guidance, uh, God walks between, in the form of the Shekinah, he walks between the pieces of the animals, binding the covenant upon himself and himself alone. So that means that the covenant is binding upon God alone no matter what Abraham and Abraham's descendants may do. So the covenant is unconditional, it's unilateral. God has made certain commitments to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants regardless of whether Abraham or Abraham's descendants themselves remain faithful. The promise will be kept no matter what. Why? Because our God is a promise-keeping God. He's made a one-way promise there. So in chapter 15, the covenant has been sealed. Now let's look at verse 18. Remember this verse? On that day the Lord made a covenant with Avram. Saying, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So what are the borders of the promised land? Well, here is a look at the Middle East there. God just said that the Euphrates is, a, is the northern border and the river of Egypt is the southern border. Now if we compare other sections of scripture that go ahead and describe the promised land, this is the information we gather. Basically, God gives Abraham the western arm of the Fertile Crescent. Now let's take a look at this. First of all, the southern border is the river of Egypt. Now where's the river of Egypt? Now commentators have made some kind of, um, to me, silly decisions regarding what the river of Egypt is. Some people feel that it's where the Suez Canal is now. Well, that was just a marsh in Abraham's day. It never was a river. And uh, that's a very, for, very, very poor choice because the moment the Jewish people crossed over that area, they would have been in the land of, uh, of Canaan, right? But we didn't enter the land in Canaan until we entered the, went over the Jordan River. So that can't be the boundary of the land. So it's not the area of the, uh, of the um, Suez Canal. Others, other commentators say, well, it must be the eastern arm of the Nile Delta. See, as the Nile River comes down, it gets to the lowlands, and then it splits into numerous, numerous tributaries. <clears throat> and so some commentators say, see that eastern side of that green triangle, the eastern side of the, of the Egyptian Delta, that would be the river of Egypt. Well, again, the moment the Jewish people crossed over the Nile River, we would be in the Promised Land, right? 
That didn't happen. It happened when we crossed the Jordan River, not when we crossed over the Nile River. So those are two very, very poor choices, but you'll see them in the, in the commentaries. The river of Egypt is the Wadi al-Arish, and the Wadi al-Arish is located right there. It's a dry riverbed in the summertime, water flowing through it in the wet season. And you can see that's exactly where it enters into the Mediterranean Sea. So that is the southern border. And can you see the, the, um, the uh, Euphrates River up there to the north? Up to the north, we come to the Euphrates River. This is the northern border. So if you uh, compare this scripture with a number of others, you can determine that the boundaries of the Promised Land look something like this. Look something like this. From the Wadi al Arish to the River Euphrates. Now here is a um, picture of the Fertile Crescent. And you can see the Euphrates River there in the middle of the uh, Fertile Crescent. The Tigris is on the eastern side. So again, from the Wadi al Arish all the way up to the, uh, to the um, Euphrates River, this is the land promised to Abraham. And you have this map, you have this map on set page 17. So that's basically the, the uh, land that God has promised Abraham. As you can see, the Jewish people only possess about 30% of that land today. We have never possessed all the promised land. We do not do so today. All right. So the Abrahamic covenant. How much in Question. Excuse me? How much in Solomon's day? Uh, I will get into that in a little bit. I'll show you. We, we about 75% in Solomon's day. About 75%, yeah. All right, but I'll show you. Uh, we'll deal with that in a little bit. So my point. My point is that the Abrahamic covenant supports Zionism because Abraham and his descendants are unconditionally promised a homeland. And this is long before the Arab peoples appeared on the scene. The year that this covenant is signed and sealed in Genesis 15 is approximately 2166 BC. 2100 BC, approximately. Now the Arab peoples, here's your map, the Arab peoples would not sweep out of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula for another 2,800 years. All right, 2,800 years after the covenant is signed, the Mohammedans would come out of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula to conquer this area. Okay? Now the people living in the land when the Abrahamic covenant was ratified are listed in Genesis 15. Verses 19 through 21, we read that. Here are the people groups living in the western arm of the Fertile Crescent. The Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Rephaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. Those are the people groups living in that area. Yes, question. Did you say 2166 B.C.? Uh, approximately 2166 B.C., yeah, 2166 B.C. It's in your notes there. All right, now these are all Canaanite tribes, and every single one of these tribes, every single one of these people groups have disappeared from history. They do not exist anymore. There's no descendants around. And guess what? None of these people groups are Arab, all right? None of these people groups are Arab peoples. These are Canaanite tribes. And so this command that the Palestinians have been, uh, this command, this position that the Cal Palestinians have been in the land of Israel since time immemorial is a gross exaggeration and is a, it's patently a lie, okay? The Canaanite tribes were living there, okay? Does that make sense? All right, question. Could the Canaanites have been descendants of Esau? No, the Canaanites are Semitic peoples, but e the descendants of Esau are the Edomites. The, they're, not, they're not on the scene at this point in time. These people... Well, they can't make any argument that the Canaanites are also Arabs. No, the Canaanites are not Arabs. These are all peoples that uh, were living in the land before the Arab peoples moved in there. You know, the Arab peoples were living in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. The, the descendants of Ishmael and others descendants of Hagar, the Arab peoples today are really an uh, amalgamation of many, many different tribes. But basically they are descendants of Ishmael. Okay. 
and they were living in Saudi Arabia, what we call Saudi Arabia today. Did see, I see another question? Yeah, I mean, uh, we did a little study on this. Noah, Noah's kids, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Mm-hmm, and, right. And Canaan was Ham's son. Son, yeah, right. So they're descendants of the Canaanites. Canaan. 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 came from Shem. Yeah, yeah, they're Semites, uh, descendants of Canaan, yeah. So they're not Arabs. Okay? All righty. All right, I see we're running out of time, and that's, this is a good place to run out of time because we'll take a look at the next covenant that supports Zionism, and that's uh, the land covenant in Deuteronomy 28. So that'll be on page 18. Uh, we'll go ahead and pick that up next week at the top of page 18 as we look at the next covenant that supports Zionism. So let me go ahead and pray, and I'll turn you guys loose. Gee, two minutes ahead of time. That's, uh, that's kind of uh, unique for me. It's usually two minutes after. All right, let's pray. Father, again, we want to stop and thank you for your word and thank you for who you are. We've seen in your word here that you are, uh, you've made a promise to the Jewish people and that you are a promise-keeping God. You will keep your promises to Abraham as descendants. You will keep your promises to all those that love you and trust you. And so we know that the promises you have made that apply to us today in the 21st century will be fulfilled as well. So we are grateful for who you are and that we can trust you. So Lord, help us to take that trust and that message that you are a promise keeper to uh, the world around us that does not trust you and does not want much to do with you. And Lord, help us to take this message also to the vast percentage of Jewish people today that don't even believe in you, that are atheists and agnostics. And help us take this promise uh, of the Messiah to those Jewish people that may be religious but have re rejected Jesus. Lord, help us to promote your promises in this world. And we ask you to Empower us to do this. Help us to do that through your Holy Spirit. We need his direction. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Alrighty, we'll see you next week.